And um, I do hope that we'll have a chance to meet face to face, uh, either at meetings in Boston or Oxford, or indeed with our um, African colleagues. I still travel extensively and hope to meet you soon. Um, what we're going to... Uh, no. Clearly I've got to see if I can make the slides move. This is interesting. Yeah, if you, if you scroll through the slide, we'll just be saying what you're doing. Like, just... Oh, there we go. I'll do it by hand. So, one of the things that has always struck me when we're working with our colleagues in emergent nations are the many obstacles that you face in terms of engaging with research. Clearly, there are resource limitations that work at every level of the system. And when we talk about clinical research, we need central investment in IRB. I think in terms of supporting our colleagues uh, with respect to uh, writing protocols, um, um, pulling the necessary regulatory information together to be able to run clinical trials. Um, of course, we need to invest in research infrastructure uh, and registration. In the United Kingdom, I helped to lead our national cancer plan, and we developed a, a research infrastructure plan too. Um, if we go back 15 years or so, about 2% of eligible cancer patients were entered into clinical trials in the United Kingdom. And with investment in people, investment in infrastructure, uh, investment in IRBs and so on, that figure is now about 15%. And that, that compares very favorably with our friends and colleagues in the US, where again, it's only the, the tiny minority of patients who are entered in clinical trials. So we know that with leadership, with investment, with support, we can make a huge impact in terms of recruiting more of our patients to clinical trials. I know that for many of you, it's extremely difficult to find protected time. And that's one of the great benefits that I have um, working in Oxford in that I have two full clinical days a week doing ward rounds in the clinic seeing patients, but I have three days for research. And I trained as a clinical researcher and as a laboratory scientist. So I have a, um, the wealth of experience of this great university and protected time to be able to pursue a research career. And that's perhaps one of the sort of key things that we would take to um, ministers of education, of health, um, in emergent nations, but how can we train and protect time for the next generation of clinicians coming through? Um, let me see if I can get to the next slide. <laughs> God. Um, okay. oh, there we go. So the general principles that we would want to make in terms of um, establishing a clinical research infrastructure is to strengthen the evidence base to guide cancer control in public health settings. And again, we have some great evidence from the UK from our um, uh, from our national cancer planning, how to go about this. Um, I think validating intervention in specific populations is important. And of course, posing the questions about how can we be cost effective in terms of how we train and um, deliver clinical research. And then how do we take that clinical research into frontline clinical care? If we're thinking about how we uh, promote innovations in Africa, then we held with our AFROX meeting, uh, with our AFROX organization, um, an excellent meeting in uh, London um, some years ago, um, in which we did come to a consensus as to what action we should take. Uh, and, uh, and obviously there is building research training capacity regionally, um, providing some central services for clinical research. For example, statistical advice is key to any clinical trial protocol, but there aren't that many good medical statisticians around. So, you know, if we had some hub centralized resources, that that's the sort of support that we could provide. Developing joint projects, um, twinning and linking centers 
uh, across Africa, um, linking centres between north and south. Um, but the idea of integrating, um, building transnational networks is something that, that seems important to me. And again, how can we learn from our colleagues who are delivering effective clinical research, particularly in the fields of communicable diseases, AIDS, TB, malaria? I mean, for example, Oxford has a, um, some of you may know that Oxford has a field station in Kenya with our colleagues who are looking at malaria and TB. We have a field station in Vietnam, but the focus has always been predominantly on communicable diseases. And I think those of us who practice oncology, who um, care for patients with non-communicable disease, with, with, um, uh, with cancer, with respiratory disease and so on, we need to see if we can learn the lessons um, from our colleagues in communicable disease. Often we're asked, why should we develop studies in Africa? Uh, I, I would always argue that we are part of a global community. The world has never been more connected. If you think about it geopolitically, um, um, we're connected by the internet, um, we're connected by speed of dissemination by information, and we're connected genetically. Uh, the more we study genetics, the more we understand where the path and bath of birth came from. So we need to build in that interconnectedness um, to learn more about how we can um, learn from different ethnic groups who are in truly global clinical trials. Um, I mean, in terms of the genetics of our interconnectedness, nobody in the world is more distant than a 50th cousin. So we can trace genetic trees back, but all of us in the call just now are closer than 50th cousins, which is a remarkable thing that always makes me smile. If you look at the air that we breathe, um, every time we take a breath, it's one six trillion atoms are taken in. And what it means is that because of the restless winds covering the world within one year, each of us, each of us listening, talking just now, will have breathed the air of everyone who has ever lived in Earth. So I quite like that sort of sense of us sharing the world becoming a village, a community, and of us learning from each other, um, as we see in this slide. I think the idea of promoting the establishment of centres of excellence in cancer with a, um, a strong portfolio of research is important, offering high quality facilities for training, research services, and um, rapidly over time reducing dependence on foreign institutions. And of course, within this, is trying to minimize the brain drain. Now, I, I say that working as somebody in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, and I know that there are more Ghanaian nurses working in London than there are in Accra. So uh, there's no doubt that in the United Kingdom to feed the massive growth in our National Health Service, we have many African nurses and doctors working very successfully within our healthcare system. And those who are leading at the top of our profession in the UK feel that we need to put more back and see what we can do to offer um, improved careers, career consolidation, to try to minimize the, the brain drain of high quality African nurses and doctors. The, this concept of African centers of excellence was developed by our friends from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and you'll see some of the ideas that we have here, um, the, the sorts of elements that we would bring to what a centre of excellence might be, and the idea about identifying and building a network, a transnational network of centres of excellence is something that would be attractive to me. We'll, we'll talk more of this later with some of the work that we've done elsewhere, showing how this is possible, and, and clearly having partnerships with our friends and colleagues in uh, Harvard, uh, I would hope ourselves in Oxford, you know, two of the great universities in the world with the experience of building these networks is something that we would hope to pursue and look at together. M moving to the more formal part of the lecture, um, I'd like to talk a little about 
um, clinical trial structure, uh, the different phases and elements of it, and, and some details of them. Uh, phase one trials, I've been a cancer doctor for 34 years. Um, uh, and I guess I, um, as a young fellow, did some of the first phase one trials we had ever performed in the United Kingdom. And I must have done over a hundred of these over my uh, relatively long career. So we'll spend a little time discussing those. Uh, phase two trials, uh, often called the valley of death for any new anti-cancer drug, um, is when we try to make an estimate of drug activity and to decide if we should push the drug forward into randomized phase three trials. And of course, in phase three, that's when we try to make a definitive comparison of any new agent versus existing gold standards. Um, clearly, the key elements of any phase three trial are um, as carefully as we can to choose the uh, primary objective. Um, what do we measure? Is it progression-free survival? Is it overall survival? Is it tumour shrinkage? That m much thought should be given to that. And as I mentioned earlier, having good statistical support to determine the sample size is critical. So the definition of a phase one trial, uh, this is the evaluation of a new cancer therapy in humans. And it could be a small molecule, a chemical, it could be a virus, it could be a, an antibody. But this would be the first um, time that human beings had been exposed to this novel therapeutic agent. Um, it, it may be a single agent study, it may be a combination of novel agents, um, it may be, uh, for example, combining a new drug with one that's been previously approved. Um, but the key thing is that the patients that we tend to recruit to phase one trials are those who are have disease which is refractory um, to conventional treatment. So uh, I see patients in our clinic on Friday, they may have had three lines of chemotherapy for their advanced or metastatic colorectal cancer, but they've progressed. We have nothing else to offer. Uh, the patient would ask, there must be something, and we would direct them towards our phase one clinical trials portfolio. If we look at the patient population that we tend to bring in, um, the, the sorts of eligibility criteria are shown here. Um, tumours which are refractory to conventional treatment, so no standard options left. We, we do try to choose patients with a decent performance status. Um, we try to select patients who have at least three months of life expectancy, and that usually goes with a performance status of, of zero or one. Of course, we want to have reasonable um, uh, biochemical and hematological function. Um, we may have specifications about prior therapy that's been allowed or the time between um, stopping conventional treatment and starting. And of course, we don't want patients who've got serious intercurrent disease, um, you know, significant heart disease, significant psychiatric, pulmonary, et cetera, et cetera. So although these are, these are patients with refractory disease, we want to try and select patients who are in reasonable shape. So the basic tenets of the phase one study are shown here, and it is to define a recommended dose. So we're not looking for measures of effectiveness, of efficacy, of tumour shrinkage, of prolongation of survival. We're basically doing a controlled toxicity study to define a recommended dose. And we want to try and do this safely, efficiently and reliably. But safety trumps everything else. So the fundamental question for anyone who wants to undertake a phase one trial is, how do we select a starting dose? What are the endpoints of the study in terms of us assessing safety? How many patients do we think we would have to recruit? And these are dose escalation studies. So how quickly do we build the dose up? Because clearly there is a paradox. If we start at a very low dose, even though the primary endpoint of the study is safety, as ethical doctors, we must have intention to treat. 
We must believe that because of the preclinical pharmacology of the drug, because of data showing it has anti-cancer properties um, in the test tube, in vivo in mouse models, we, we need to feel that there's a possibility that this drug could control or shrink the cancer down. Therefore, from the safety point of view, we want to escalate slowly. But from the point of view of hoping we can demonstrate some efficacy, we want to escalate rapidly. So you see there's a tension there. The starting dose is very um, carefully defined. It's one-tenth of the LD10 in mice. So the laboratory toxicology team find a dose of the drug that will kill 10% of mice. We then take a tenth of that dose, and there's some standard formula that allows you to calculate, you know, to do with, the, the, you know, clearly mice are smaller than we are, but there's some standard formula that allows to scale the dose up. So a tenth of the LD10 is a starting dose that I've been using for the past 34 years. Some drugs, the patterns of toxicity are seen in larger mammals, for example, dogs. And there we would take one third of the to something called the toxic dose low. Um, it, it's not so usual. Most of the work is done in mouse toxicology, but um, it's quite possible that we'd be doing something larger numbers. Uh, the dose is expressed in milligrams per meter squared, and we have a long history of using this. So the endpoints, as I mentioned already, are dose toxicity. We invariably look at the drug's pharmacokinetics to see if we can generate plasma concentrations which are similar to those which are effective in the test tube. The classical goals are shown here, identifying dose-limiting toxicities and therefore the maximum tolerated dose and a recommended dose that will go forward to phase two testing. Increasingly in modern phase one trials, we do try to take tissue samples, preferably of the tumour, sometimes of normal tissue, and we try and look at the pharmacodynamics of the drug. You remember pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. So if we've developed a drug with a very specific target in mind, and we can take biopsies or blood samples, that would allow us to demonstrate whether we actually inhibit the target in human beings. That can be a very valuable, we can build very valuable PKPD models linking blood concentrations to a target inhibition. What are those limiting toxicities? In general terms, there are those which are considered due to their severity or duration, unacceptable, and um, for us and our patients, a feeling that we could no longer give higher doses of that drug. We would define them in advance of beginning the trial. So for example, it could be um, grade four neutropenia, uh, which lasts for more than five or six days. It could be grade four neutropenia uh, with fever. Um, it could be a platelet count of 10,000 or less. It could be grade three or greater non-hematologic toxicity or a pattern of side effects, which the duration of which means that you've got to wait for more than two or three weeks before you can reschedule treatment. So we're talking about serious um, grade three, grade four toxicity, which is potentially life-threatening. The maximum tolerated dose is usually defined as a dose in which a third of patients experience unacceptable toxicity. Um, so, if we had, uh, I'll show you a, um, I'll show you a, um, a dose escalation statement. But this would be two out of six patients with grade four neutropenia and fever, two out of six patients with grade three um, hepatotoxicity, um, that that sort of thing. Um, and what we tend to do is once we have identified the maximum tolerated dose, um, um, that, that's what we would call a dose limiting toxicity. The dose level immediately below that would be the recommended dose. 
So we build the dose of the drug up until we see unacceptable toxicity. We then drop down to the dose level immediately before that, treat more patients there, and that would be the recommended dose that would go forward to phase two testing. Um, so classically, we have three patients per cohort. This is interesting when you think about it. As I said at the beginning of our, of our small talk, um, I'm very interested in the genetics of um, the genetics of susceptibility to cancer. We have a very large research program looking at genetic susceptibility to colorectal cancer. I'm interested in genetic susceptibility to side effects and toxicity. And we've done a lot of work identifying some of the germline genetic determinants that associated with that. So although we spend a lot of time talking about precision medicine and matching the right drug to the right patient and doing a lot of clever next generation sequencing and so on, the only thing that we can really control as physicians is the dose of the drug. You or I cannot control the genetics of the patient that we treat, but we can control the dose that we administer. And if you look at the figures here, we're basing drug dosing for potentially tens, hundreds of thousands of cancer patients by treating only three patients at every dose level. So, I mean, we would argue very strongly that's quite statistically unstable. So let me show you the sort of tend, the way that we tend to increase the um, dose levels. Um, so we have the um, starting dose, one tenth of the LD10 in mice. We treat three patients. If we see no toxicity, um, if we see no toxicity, we double the dose, treat three more patients. If we see no toxicity, we double the dose, treat th three more patients and so on, until eventually um, we see dose-limiting toxicity, as we discussed earlier on. So if we saw dose-limiting toxicity in one or two out of three patients, we would recruit another three patients. And remember, if we see dose-limiting significant unacceptable toxicity in two out of six patients, that's the dose limiting toxicity. And we would then go down to the immediately preceding dose level, add another three patients, convince ourselves that um, um, less than one of these patients had dose limiting toxicity, and that would be a recommended dose. So in a trial which is only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 21 patients, that could potentially set the dose for a drug which may treat hundreds of thousands of patients. And that's, that's something that we may discuss or consider at the end of this small talk. The dose escalation, the mathematics of it, is something called a modified Fibonacci schedule in that what, what happens is at the low dose levels in the absence of toxicity, we dose escalate rapidly. But when we see toxicity, grade one, grade two, starting to appear, we slow down and we increase by one third of the previous dose level. So for example, um, say, say we'd just given somebody 15 units of a drug um, and we saw a couple of patients had grade two toxicity. So this isn't dose limiting, but it's a warning sign that some side effects are starting to appear. So the next dose level would be um, one third of 15, which is five. Five plus 15 would equal 20. So the dose escalation would be from 15 to 20 individuals. Again, if we're seeing um, um, grade two toxicity, the next dose level from 20 would be a third of 20, um, whatever that would be, six point something. So the next dose level would go from 20 to 26 and so on um, until eventually we hit um, what we would consider unacceptable toxicity. So that gives you an idea. F Fibonacci was um, a fascinating um, Italian scholar from Venice. Um, he was interested in the mathematics of uh, the growth of rabbit population. 
um, he traded in rabbit fur. So he made a great study of the growth of rabbit populations, and he came up with this um, this um, scheme, the um, the Fibonacci escalation scheme. Um, and he was also somebody. He was a, a very widely travelled um, individual, and it was he who first brought Arabic numerals um, to the West. So yeah, this is going back many centuries. So God bless Fibonacci. Um, Again, this is just um, saying a little more of what we've just said around cohort escalation. No toxicity. We just um, double the dose and put three patients in. If we see dose-limiting toxicity in one out of three patients, we add another three patients coming in. Um, and if in those second cohort of three patients there are no dose-limiting toxicities, therefore there's only one out of six, we would go on to the next dose level and so on until we see at least two out of six patients um, suffering with um, um, suffering with um, unacceptable toxicity. So that's that's phase one design. I mean, the ethics of it are complex and challenging. Clearly, we are recruiting patients to a study in which there is relatively little likelihood of them benefiting but as an absolutely necessary step in terms of us defining a safe and subsequent dose of the drug to take forward. Um, and the only way in order to um, uh, ethically to recruit patients to these studies is to have fully informed consent. And as part of that consent, explain to the patient that the benefits of them, uh, the benefits for them will be small. People often ask, is there a model, do patients volunteer for phase one trials because they think they may be benefiting other people? This is, this is something called the altruistic model. The truth is, when we have done large surveys of patients, more than 90% of patients say it's not for themselves, but rather, I beg your pardon, they say it's not for others, but all of them are just grasping at straws, clutching to any tiny chance that they might benefit. And that's why we need to be ethically very aware and very careful when we recruit patients to these studies. Phase two trials are when we take the recommended dose and now we ask the question, is this drug effective? And is this a drug that we think is sufficiently interesting to take forward to phase three trials? And, and this, is, this is where drug development teams called the valley of death. This is where drugs fail. Um, the, the model that we tend to use is a, is a two-stage model uh, developed by Gihan. Um, but, but again, we're screening for therapeutic activity. We'll get more information on toxicity, um, but um, we'll see what happens. The phase two design that, that, that I favor is um, something called uh, Gihan's two-stage um, Gihan's two-stage design. It's double sampling, and what we want to do is we want to reject ineffective drugs as quickly as possible. We don't want to continue to expose patients to drugs which have no chance of benefiting them in this clinical trial setting. So the first decision in the Gihan design is, is the drug unlikely to be effective in X percent of patients? Um, so there's a sort of gate, if you like. And decision two is, could the drug be effective in X percent of patients? So typically, we set the barrier at around 20%. So um, we should set the bar quite high and saying we're looking for a 20% response rate, a 20% disease control rate seems reasonable to me. So we've got a fixed dose of the drug. We set the parameters for yes. the We enter 14 patients, and if no responses are seen, the trial is stopped. We declare that the true drug response rate is less than 20% and the drug will not be taken forward, the drug is killed. However, if we see one or more responses in the first 14 patients, 
then we would aim to recruit a further, um, usually 20 to 40 patients. And that gives us a better estimate of response rate and confidence interval. And usually in phase two trials, um, for us as oncologists, it's tumor response rates or disease control that we're that we're tending to measure. How did we come up with how did we come up with this design? And why do we have 14 patients in the first step? It is simple probability, and it's us computing the probability of consecutive failures. Um, so, so what you show here is that um, if we set our target for a 20% response rate, uh, the probability of one patient failing is 0.8. And you can just see the arithmetic here. As we go down through 1 to 14 patients, eventually we get to a, um, a probability of less than 0 0.05, which tells us that if the drug was likely to be 20% or more effective, then there would be a 95.6% chance of at least one success. So the statistical underpinning of the Gihan design uh, presented in the early 60s is very strong. And, and that's why um, if we see no responses in the first 14 patients, I think we can be very confident of saying that's a drug that doesn't work. Now, clearly, um, you may choose to set the, the barrier higher or lower. But very conventionally, it's just set saying that we'd like to see responses in 20% of patients. This, this um, study shows the um, importance of sample size. So this is common sense. The um, more effective we think the drug will be, the higher we set the barrier for progression from phase one to phase two in the Gihan design, the more effective the drug, the higher the barrier, the fewer the patients that you need. If you want to set the barrier lower, if you say we're dealing with a very resistant disease, we're dealing with a, a, a tumor type in which there are no drugs that are effective at all, therefore if we saw a 10% or 5% response rate, that, that would be something that we could work with. You see, you can still use the same design, but you have to enter many more patients. So for example, if we set the uh, barrier at um, effectiveness of 5%, instead of entering 14 patients, you would enter 59. And if you saw no responses in those first 59 patients, then the drug is dead. It's not developed any further. And again, you see the common sense in that. In terms of working out the number of additional patients, uh, again, there's a mathematical formula for this. Um, the minimum would be a, 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 an additional 11. But clearly, for the second phase, so we've seen one or more responses in the first 14 patients. And frankly, the more patients you put into the second phase, the better the confidence intervals, the tighter the confidence intervals will be when you come to say this drug's likely got a response rate of 23%, plus or minus whatever the confidence intervals are. So usually um, in the second part of the phase two design, patients uh, uh, trialists usually bring in maybe an extra 20, 30, 40 patients. So your first 14 patients, and then the more patients you bring in subsequently, the better the estimate you'll get of the true effectiveness of the drug. So the, the absolute minimum would be a number, of, uh, uh, an additional 11 patients. It's unusual to see a trial that small, and it's much commoner to see a phase two trial with 40 or 50 patients in total, um, just for the reasons that we mentioned. One of the things that I am interested in just now, and it's a link between my laboratory and clinical research, is to look at classifiers of disease. So uh, I said earlier on that all of us are interested in precision medicine. This is us trying to 
um, identify which of our patients will benefit most from the treatments that we give. We've been doing a lot of work on prognostic markers. I've got a big interest in the adjuvant treatment of colorectal cancer, and we've developed some actually quite effective markers of prognosis so that in patients who have their colorectal cancer resected, we are applying these tests to the resected tumor tissue. And it gives me an idea as to whether the disease is biologically aggressive and therefore more likely to need adjuvant chemotherapy or biologically more relatively benign. And therefore we may be able to avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is information that goes beyond TNM staging and beyond some of the other criteria which are currently used. So prognosis is really important. But what would be ideal for us would be to have a predictive biomarker. So this is what we would call a companion diagnostic in which the drug is proven to be more or less effective in patients who have a particular biomarker. Um, in, in my world, um, collectal cancerology, as in yours, we use KRAS mutant status to decide whether we should or should not give epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors. Lung cancer is being increasingly broken down into a variety of different biomarker-driven subtypes in which we can use fusion proteins to select particular drugs for particular types of lung cancer and so on. So I, I'm really interested in developing genomic classifiers for drugs. When should we develop them? And I think, I think there's good evidence to suggest that we should start to develop these, these biomarkers, these companion diagnostics during phase two trials. Um, um, just interested to get your thoughts on this next slide. So uh, let's assume that I've done quite a bit of laboratory work and I've got a biomarker which I think will predict chemosensitive patients. So if I take a biopsy of the patient's tumour, if it's biomarker positive, those patients are much more likely to respond to the drug than those who are biomarker negative. What that then gives us to do, we've got two potential study designs. One is shown here. So we would take a biopsy, do the biomarker test on all patients. Patients who are biomarker positive, who are predicted responsive, would then be randomized in the trial, in a phase two randomized trial of the new drug with the companion diagnostic versus the existing a gold standard, whatever that control treatment would be. Patients who were biomarker negative um, and who were predicted to be non-responsive would go off study. They would be treated with the gold standard. They would be treated according to local clinician preference. If we look at the next slide, though, you'll see there's an other model that we can look at. It's the same idea. We've developed a biomarker of chemoresponsiveness. We biopsy and do the biomarker test on all patients. But in this trial design, those patients which are biomarker positive are randomized to the new drug versus a standard drug. But those patients who are biomarker negative, instead of excluding them from the trial, we also do the same trial design, randomized phase two, in which those patients who are biomarker negative and predicted to be unresponsive would be randomized to the new treatment versus standard treatment too. So clearly the second study would require more patients, it would require more time, it would require more dollars. But what it would allow us to do compared to the first trial design I showed you, it would allow us to validate the biomarker because what we would assume or hypothesize is that in those who are predicted to respond, we see a differential benefit. In the randomized phase two, we'd expect to see more patients responding in the biomarker positive group. Whereas in the um, biomarker negative group, we would predict that the response rates, um, uh, the response rates to the new drug versus control 
would either be identical or even inferior. But the information that we would gain from this trial design, more costly, more complex, um, would be that um, we would validate the biomarker. In the initial trial, we'd validate the biomarker and the drug together. But this would allow us more independent validation of the biomarker on its own. And the, the second trial design tends to be the one that we use. Part of it is because if we get informed consent from patients to do the biopsy, then if we say to patients, if you're biopsy negative, you don't get the new drug, you get standard treatment, that we've had some discussions with ethics committee who sometimes find that approach a little harsh because after all the patients are volunteering for the biopsy hoping they will be able to access the new drug and therefore by using this trial design um, it may be more ethical we can have a, a debate about that and we may get more scientific information um, networks are good uh, they are um, I am um, um, so I told you I've been a cancer doctor for 34 years and my best work comes because I work with people who are cleverer than me and um, but who are prepared to engage and share their science and ideas. So I think the process of dialectic of working together strengthens all of us. Of course there are some fantastic rugged individuals who work entirely on their own but certainly in my career I've always benefited um, from working with others, junior and senior, who are prepared to share ideas. So that can work within a hospital, within a laboratory. But I, I sort of propose that we can build networks um, to help support each other. Um, for example, uh, I'm doing a lot of work in China. I'm a visiting professor at four Chinese universities. Um, um, so I'm doing a lot of work building networks in China and we've done a lot of work building networks in India and what I would hope is that with the Harvard Global Catalyst and Oxford working together we can start to build some clinical research networks across um, our work in sub-Saharan, our work across sub-Saharan Africa. Why are networks good? Um, well uh, you get better ideas and by working with people that you trust, you can reflect. It's, it's a process of dialectic, of discussion, but you can reflect and refine and improve ideas together. Um, but there are practical things. You speed up recruitment. Um, multinational recruitment aids local drug registration. It may reduce costs. And I'm, I'm always interested in exploring genetic differences. So if we have a trial which is recruiting patients from from the US, from the UK, from Africa, from China. That's quite an interesting genetic mix. And if we were to see differential responses in those ethnic groups, I would want to explore why and, and seek to understand that genetically. Um, the, the, first, the first oncology research network I built was with uh, my great friends in India. This is our INDOX network. Uh, these are India's top leading public cancer centers. I got a grant to do this work from um, a couple of large pharma companies and we trained and had more than 120 young Indian oncologists coming to Oxford for short courses and um, to pick up in our uh, trials work. And, and I'm still connected to and friendly with all of these, um, all of these fantastic centers. I mean, the, um, the Tata Memorial in Mumbai sees 40,000 new cancer patients a year. These are remarkably busy, fertile places for research. And of course, the pattern of disease is different. I get to learn about cholangiocarcinoma because I have friends and colleagues in India who know much more about the disease than me. So that when I see patients with cholangiocarcinoma or gallbladder cancer in, in Oxford, I can reflect in the experience of true experts who are managing the disease much more frequently and commonly than I do. What, 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 I, I don't know much about the treatment of Kaposi's sarcoma, but I would learn a lot from the network of individuals who are listening to this lecture just now because it's part of your day and daily practice, not mine. So you see how networks can build intelligence and help support. 
Um, this is some of the work that we're doing in China. Um, China's a number. Uh, cancer is a number one kill. Lung cancer is a number one killer in China. Um, it's an extraordinary burden of disease in an extraordinarily large country, um, with you know increasingly great infrastructure, some very well trained physicians and surgeons, but with a huge burden of disease to treat that that causes real difficulty. So we have research um, support and. Um, <coughs> networks there, and I'm, I'm a professor at, at each of these universities. Let me talk a little about our Journal of Global Oncology, if you don't mind. Um, we, we set this up in ASCO a couple of years ago, so I kicked it off as editor-in-chief. It's been overtaken by my great friend and colleague, Dr. Gilberto Lopez, a fantastic a Brazilian US oncologist with you know great energy and a desire to move the journal forward. Um, and I'd like to see more work coming forward from Africa to this journal. Um, it's an online only open access journal, um, which means that you can go on to it. When we finish this lecture, I'd love all of you to go online and have a look at it. Um, get a feel for the journal. Um, um, uh, lots of the information will be relevant to your daily practice. Uh, we publish bi-monthly. Uh, we've been going since 2015. We have um, original reports, review articles, commentaries, editorials, case reports. The, my, my, so I, I've been publishing for a long time, so I've got something called an H index of 90. I've got over 40,000 citations, but the first publication I ever made as a medical student was in the British Medical Journal, and it was a case report. All of us have got to start somewhere, and if you're seeing interesting or unusual cases or challenging cases, we'd love to hear about them in, in JGO. The ASCO stable of journals has got a remarkably wide readership. Um, they tell me of 54 million people, the rigorous standards of peer review. So, so getting into JGO is good for your CV, is good for your university. And uh, have a look at it. I think there's a high standard of production. This gives you a feel for the number of submissions by article type. Um, so we can, if there's a particular area you would like to review or if there's a commentary you would like to make about cancer treatment in your centre or your country, we would welcome uh, looking at that. So, so let, let me finish now um, just by summarising a little of what we've talked about. Um, partnerships are key and we need to develop sustainable models that link interested parties together. And, and those may be um, within countries, within continents or across continents. They can occur at many different levels. Um, I think we need a strong intellectual base to encourage this research activity. And I know that those of you who are gathered around the table are you or they in terms of doing that. I think the notion about having academic and industrial partners is important too. Um, we have many great universities gathered around the table, but funding even within the great universities is tight. So the idea about seeking collective cohesive funding, perhaps from pharma partners. That's how we set up our Indox networks. And that may be something that we might consider um, as a collective group, seeing if we can get pharma to work with us to help seed some of these initiatives and perhaps get partnered funding from government and so on to move forward. Um, so, so let, let me finish there. Uh, it's always difficult concentrating in someone's voice for long periods of time. Th thanks very much indeed for listening. Um, clearly, we'll leave the slides online, and uh, I don't know if credit and colleagues have um, recorded my um, you know, my usual sort of ramblings and so on. But it's been uh, a delight for me to be able to do this. A delight for me to support my great friends. Uh, uh, as part of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst, wonderful organization with Will, my great friend Ahmed Al-Zoe. Um, but uh, thanks for listening. 
I'm not sure quite happens now. I don't know if you post questions or if there's a question and answer session. But certainly I've got another five or ten minutes if anyone would like to ask any specific questions. Sure. I think the, the ground is open for questions. People are always very shy. Well, listen, don't worry about it. It's been my pleasure doing this. Uh, I have two small children who are getting ready for our Halloween party tomorrow. So I've got to go and carve some pumpkins for them. So listen, thanks for listening and hopefully I'll be able to meet you face to face sometime soon. All right. Thank you very much. Not at all. Bye bye. Yeah, bye.